Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Kempinen from the Merowith Center. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Keep Your Head in the Game, Boost Brain Health with Dr. David Carr. When we first decided to do this program, our first and best choice of speakers was Dr. Carr. Oh, Dr. thank you. Dr. David Carr is the Alan A. and Edith Wolf Professor of Geriatric Medicine and the Clinical Director of the Division of Geriatric and Nutritional Science at Washington University School of Medicine. That's a mouthful. And what it means is he is the guru of brain health and truly the best of the best. No. And I have to say, Dr. Carr is, is as nice as he is brilliant. So we're very honored to have you here today, Dr. Carr. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our esteemed speaker. Susan, thank you for that uh, very kind uh, introduction and hope I can uh, um, deliver a talk that's uh, worthy of those uh, accolades. And anyone, welcome everybody. Glad you're here. Glad we're having a little bit warmer weather. I did uh, slip back to the house so I could walk the dog. So I apologize uh, right off if uh, he starts yapping and uh, hopefully there won't be too much traffic at the front door, but uh, I'm gonna apologize about that straight ahead. Hey, I'm really excited about this talk and I know you guys have read a lot of stuff in this area um, and you kind of have your insights and maybe what's worked for you. Uh, my tour today is gonna be pretty much through um, some of the reviews, uh, the meta-analyses, some of the things that I think we can say with confidence, uh, and we'll we'll start our tour through here, and I'll be interested to see uh, how you think everything is. I think first what I need to do is do a little share uh, of the screen, and then we'll fire it up. I think first question I need to ask, um, can you see the screen? <laughs> okay, all right. And the second question I always have to ask, because days are busy, so are nights, do I have the right topic? I think I do, right? I'm in the, all right, I'm in the right place, the right topic, and the screen's showing, so we're good. All right, uh, get ready, put your sneakers on, your silver sneakers or whatever colors they are, and you can say hi to Dobby, he's, uh, he's a character. Uh, first, some disclosures. I don't think there's anything uh, conflict of interest here. It's always important for us. Um, we feel like when we're talking, if we have any biases, uh, but this isn't a treatment on Alzheimer's disease. This is a prevention. And uh, even though I've read and I know a little bit about that, um, I, I don't have any uh, areas. I think that would be a conflict, but happy to discuss that. So let's go through. I think it's important when we talk prevention, um, when we look at the scientific evidence, we have to say, well, is this just an association or is it really a causation? Do we think it really makes sense? And we're gonna talk about that because a lot of the prevention literature, we don't have a lot of randomized trials to really prove that they work. So we have to be a little cautious in our interpretation. Um, but I think first it's uh, just a few minutes, if you'll allow me to go back on what's happening to our brains. And it's not just Alzheimer's brains. If you're over age 50, 55, you're probably starting to accumulate some of the pathology. That's the uh, sad part of it. But the good part of it is by the end of this talk, there's a lot of ways I think we can slow it down and hopefully prevent it from not becoming symptomatic. Uh, so we're gonna talk about different behaviors, different interventions. And then I'm actually gonna leave the community resources at the end because that's where you guys come in. Um, I know where I go to kind of work out and socialize. But I want to hear where you guys go and make recommendations to some of your uh, peers and other folks on, you know, where you can uh, practice some of these things. Uh, maybe your yoga club, it may be your own home gym, that sort of thing. But I think um, uh, it's always important to talk collectively on what we need to do. So this talk today isn't about mild cognitive impairment, where you have some mild symptoms and they're not interfering activities. Uh, this talk today isn't about, you know, dementia. And, and uh, but it is about preventing Alzheimer's. I think we could appreciate, we have this sort of brain aging thing. Uh, I, it probably doesn't happen to you, but it's happening to me where, you know, maybe I can't come up with a word as quick as I used to, or my reflexes aren't quite as quick, or my ability to multitask isn't so good. Maybe I walk into a room, forget what I was gonna do. Um, I, I suspect you can relate to some of those things I said, but 
none of those, at least that I think, are interfering with my day-to-day -day activities. And so we kind of call that brain aging. And that's where we're at. So we're starting there. But unfortunately, as I said, you start getting over age 50, 55, the brain starts looking like this. And uh, maybe slowly at first, but over time, it, it starts uh, accumulating. These amyloid plaques, most brain neurodegenerative brain diseases are due to misfolded proteins. I always find that kind of interesting, but you get a, accumulate a lot of proteins and we think that at least in part contributes to a lot of the pathology. And this is gonna become important as we talk about prevention. So you have these amyloid plaques that these different proteins that are outside the brain cell and they cause a fair amount of activity from the other brain cells. There's uh, inflammatory uh, type efforts, uh, uh, what we call phagocytosis, where cells are coming in to try to grab and gobble this up. Uh, and we do think the amyloid can start kind of breaking down the synapses, these little areas, these uh, neurites, if you will, that connect that allow, it's like the telephone cord system that we have that connects our phones and our, our electricity. It starts getting chewed away by this plaque. And then inside the brain cell, as things develop, we see that this tau protein and it's specifically in Alzheimer's, phosphorylated tau. And we think this eventually messes up the brain neuron and can cause it to collapse and, and die. So we do think that prevention methods ultimately will hopefully reduce the inflammation, reduce the stress related to these plaques or get rid of them or, or decrease their accumulation. And I think that's an, an important to realize. And of course, we can go back to uh, Alzheimer's original pathology uh, back where, you know, he looked at and found these plaques and when he first stained a brain of someone who uh, had Alzheimer's disease um, and, and et cetera. Now, you may say, well, Dr. Carr, I may be 60, I may be 70, 80, 90. Is it too late for prevention? And I think that's what's going to be fun about today's talk. It's never too late. We'll see. Um, again, uh, all things being equal, the earlier you start, the better. Uh, but there's some interesting risk factors in late life, which do at least raise the potential. There's things we can do. But let's say you go back to your 50s, and over time, that amyloid will start accumulating with this little red curve. And the, the PET scans, or if you do a spinal tap and you check the fluid, they start going up. Eventually, that other protein I mentioned, tau, starts increasing. Um, your MRI will start showing some atrophy. You'll get some cognitive impairment, maybe by tests, but eventually you'll become symptomatic and get dementia. So you see this process has been going on for some time. So in a way you can say it's scary, but I actually think it's a good thing because you know whether you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even if you're up here in the symptomatic phase, you can see a lot of these things are still increasing. So we have a real potential uh, to intervene. Uh, all right. Now, if there's one article scientific you want to read, and it's technical, but I'm sure you'll be able to get through it just fine. I put it down at the bottom. It's the Lancet 2020. And boy, did this group from the UK do a deep dive. They went through hundreds, if not thousands of trials, all the latest evidence, they rated it. And this is the bulk of my talk today is to bring to you what they uh, published a couple of years ago. And, and the focus is on two things. What can you modify? Now, we know that, you know, as you get older, age is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. But last I checked, there wasn't much I could do about that. Unfortunately, the clock just keeps ticking every day. Same for you. So what they found is their risk factors in early life, risk factors in midlife, and some pretty robust risk factors in later life. Now. In their publication, the potentially modifiable risk factors only accounted for 40% of the new cases for dementia over age 70. So that means we still got 60% of our risk is unknown. Now, I'm going to address some of those at the end because I have some a bonus slide about, well, if these are the ones we can do something about now, do we know what's coming down the pike or what they left out? And I think the answer is yes, that so we're going to be able to grab another 10 or 15%, but that's what scientific literature does. You keep learning, you keep you know studying, 
and, uh, and look at things. So um, more to come on that. So let's get right into it. And let's talk about um, sort of uh, um, uh, early life stages. And, and for the purposes of this review, they said less than 45 years. And um, what's really uh, interesting um, uh, is, is this issue of, um, let me go back, I'm kind of messing with the uh, screen here, is early education, key. Now, you may be 60, 70, 80, but you've got kids, you've, you know, grandkids, other kids. When you get to over age 20, I won't say you've boosted as much you can by this mechanism, but most of the effect has to do, you know, 2024. Now, there's a lot of studies here that show that higher education, finishing high school, getting on to college, even when you correct for smoking and alcohol and all those things, appears to be protective. That's very exciting. There was a big article in the Journal of the American uh, Medical Association in 2017, um, where uh, they looked at this large cohort or sample, over 10,000 people, and they looked at it in 10 years. The average age was 75 years, 53% was female. Um, and they found out the years of education during that time of the groups they were following actually increased from 11.8 years to 12.7 and at the same time, dementia prevalence went down from 11% to 8%. Phenomenal. So here we are, you know, we're getting older as society. And between 2000 and 2010, dementia rates actually went down uh, in, in, you know, uh, developed countries. It was pretty phenomenal. And these investigators said a lot of it has to do as a society, we're getting more educated. So, so for a health brain health standpoint, we have to promote education, getting our kids, you know, try to keep them going in college and uh, high school. And um, I think we do that because of uh, a lot of reasons, but you can really be helping with your brain. And, and, and this effect was pretty robust, even, even when they adjusted for high blood pressure, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So now how does this work? Some people talk about it builds up cognitive reserve, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide because that's kind of a kind of a vague concept, this cognitive reserve. Some people feel like it strengthens the synapses, so it makes our brain cells stronger, communicate better. Now, it's true, the more educated you are, you're probably going to have a healthier lifestyle, so that could be mixed in there. Um, there are some genetic links now that are coming up that genetically, some people are more likely to do higher ed than others, and so uh, that's kind of an interesting area. We do know as people... Um, you know, go on, get college, higher incomes, they're going to probably have better access to health care. And many will have more complex jobs, which could help with mental stimulation. So all those things add up. That doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's disease if you weren't able to finish your high school um, uh, degree and that sort of thing. But uh, it's a pretty significant finding. So um, now let's talk a little bit about... Um, cognitive reserve. And what is this? What do we mean by cognitive reserve? That sounds like a good thing. So I have to tell you a funny story. So this was about, I think my, my son was in college. So this goes back a little ways. We, uh, uh, and if you've heard me talk, you may have heard me tell this story. But one of the risk factors, uh, this investigator by the name of Larson, who's at University of Washington in Seattle, was looking at was, do people with bigger heads have a less likelihood to have Alzheimer's disease. And I thought that was an interesting uh, hypothesis. So they actually looked at a large cohort in Seattle, uh, a longitudinal study, and they measured people's hat sizes. And, and sure enough, on average, if you had a larger head circumference or bigger head, you were much likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now, I thought that was fascinating. And it turns out there's about a 0.6 correlation between your hat size and your brain size. So theoretically, if you're Daniel Webster and had this big head, it's probably going to take you a long time to lose a lot of your brain mass and get symptomatic. So as we sat around the table Thanksgiving, we measured each other's uh, heads. And it turned out my son has the biggest head. We concluded he'd never get Alzheimer's. And I have the small head size, so I'm kind of waiting for it to happen. But in any event, there's nothing you can do about that. But the point is, you may build up some reserve. And you know, God gave you the brain that you have, but 
we talk about this cognitive reserve being the difference between sort of the clinical picture and their neuropathology. And some people refer that as to sort of neurobiological brain reserve. So maybe you're increasing the number of neurons or strengthening the synapses. We got brain maintenance. So uh, with cognitive reserve, we may look at the fact that, you know, due to your genetics or lifestyle, uh, you, your brain may resist or, or reduce changes of pathology. And then you've got this sort of adaptability that enables your, you know, preservation of cognitive um, uh, function. Uh, you may be able, you know, things come up in life, but you're able to continue with your healthy lifestyle behaviors. And it's hard to measure cognitive reserve. You know, people use proxy measures, education, occupational complexity, your, your leisure activity, that sort of thing. But it is an interesting concept, and it does seem to uh, be a, an important factor in people getting symptomatic. So now let's go to midlife. My, my idea of midlife is kind of changing as I'm getting, getting older, but for the purposes of the review, uh, it was age 45 to 65 years. And um, one of the things uh, that's very interesting, I thought, um, was uh, this whole issue of, um, 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 let me see, I'm having trouble seeing the top of my screen, my uh, hearing impairment, okay. So, and, and the risk that we were putting up there is has to do with the amount that we can attribute to new cases of um, Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, if the risk is 5%, there's 100 new cases of Alzheimer's, five of them could be related to this risk factor. That's kind of what we're looking at. So uh, if there's one important risk factor that I can tell you about that is like the strongest risk factor, it's hearing impairment. And this has come up quite consistently. And one study I'm quoting here was like 4,500 people, Alzheimer's Association Journal, average age 68 years, 48% female. Hearing impairment increased your risk of getting mild cognitive impairment. Wearing hearing aids reduced your risk of getting mild cognitive impairment. Now, remember, if we go back to that slide I showed you, you know, Alzheimer's disease, we believe, goes from an asymptomatic phase to a mild cognitive impairment phase and eventually to a dementia. And another st story, uh, study, hearing aid use was associated with a lower risk of dementia uh, in individuals with mild cognitive impairment. So pretty fascinating stuff. Now, I've read there's four plausible mechanisms on how hearing impairment may tie into Alzheimer's disease. And remember what I said at the beginning, association doesn't mean causation. However, one plausible mechanism is, and it makes sense and people jump on this right away. If you're not hearing, you're gonna be less likely to go out and have social interactions and, and be with people. But you know that social activity could be very stimulating and help with your cognitive reserve. Some people have said that with hearing impairment, your brain has to kind of double some resources and move them from other areas in order to uh, hear the information and process it. So there's kind of the brain drain theory. There's also some people who feel that maybe it's the same disease. We do know that um, when I take histories, people come into a dementia clinic, they'll say, well, um, I'll, I'll ask them, are they, are they understanding? And, and a lot of times the the spouse or the adult child will say, well, I don't know if they're not hearing it or they're not understanding it. Well, it could be both, but it could be they're, they're one in the same disease that um, Alzheimer's disease is causing some problems with your auditory comprehension. Um, there's the overdiagnosis hypothesis. That is where, you know, people will do worse on their cognitive tests. And so we overdiagnose them with, with uh, a dementia when really it's just more hearing impairment. Uh, and and I think, you know, socioeconomic status and education is tied in. People who wear hearing aids tend to uh, have healthier lifestyles. So I'm not sure, um, you know, I can't say wear hearing aids and you won't get Alzheimer's, but I have to say the data is pretty compelling. And when I see patients and, you know, they're at the mild stage or uh, just barely symptomatic or even further along, I highly recommend it. You know, so many times the hearing aids go into the uh, drawer and they don't want to wear them. Um, and you know, I've been pretty much point blank telling my patients, you know, you may be saving some brain cells by uh, uh, addressing this. All right.
traumatic brain injury, not a good thing for the brain, no shocker there. Now, mild TBI, where you have a little bit of a headache and maybe some uh, brief confusion uh, is probably not as big a risk factor. But if you hit your head and you end up you know, with some significant cognitive uh, impairment or some functional impairment, more what we call moderate to severe brain injury, that's definitely been showed. And this was one study in, in 2021 where they did what we call a meta-analysis. They brought all these studies together, had over 4 million people, pretty amazing. Um, and definitely traumatic brain injury was associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease and, and strongest with moderate to severe injury. And, ex and especially if you lost consciousness, if you hit your head long, you know, far enough to be out, that puts you at increased risk. Um, you know, mild, not so much. Now you can have repeated brain injury. Frankly, we haven't studied enough of the soccer players and some of those things. We, you've probably heard of uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE that has its own kind of separate pathology and somewhat controversial area. But I do think multiple blows to the head over time are, are, uh, are starting to show some uh, data associated with Alzheimer's and will probably continue. Well, what's the mechanism? We're not quite sure, but we do know when you hit your head, your blood pressure can go up and um, you can accelerate the protein deposition for amyloid and tau. You may have some arterial stiffness. And, you know, the blood bar brain barrier may be disrupted. And so any toxins or things that might be in the bloodstream may get into the blood. So we're not quite sure, but hey, how to prevent it? You guys, I know of a very busy group. Many of you are on the bike. You're out there probably not doing as much blading as you used to be. But um, so wear, wear that helmet. Uh, and that's critical. And you've got uh, kids or grandkids pass it around because uh, it's the last thing you need uh, to um, add to your risk factors. Uh, is a traumatic uh, brain injury. So high blood pressure in midlife is, is also a pretty strong risk factor. Now you say, well, why not in late life? Well, it, you probably, if you started getting high blood pressure at age 80, you're probably not gonna have it enough for 20, 30 years where it makes a difference. But in midlife, that's not to say you don't treat high blood pressure in late life. We, we know there's a lot of data that you, know, you can prevent a stroke and heart attack, but I'm talking about Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, if you let your blood pressure go in midlife, you're in trouble. So keep that under control. Um, I think, you know, the mechanism, you're probably getting teeny tiny small strokes or this, we call it white matter. The old term for that was leukoareosis. Uh, but you, you get um, uh, occlusion, you can get some leaky uh, blood vessels. Um, and, you know, you, you can also get this beta amyloid can uh, accumulate in the, um, um, in the vasculature from that standpoint. Uh, probably a stronger correlation with the high blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure. There's also been some interesting um, studies that look at uh, the difference in um, pulse pressure, which is how wide your blood pressure is. So again, if it's like 120 or over 80, that's a difference of 40 points. But if you're like 180 over 80, that's a difference of a hundred. We call that sort of the pulse pressure. And the higher the pulse pressure is, probably the more risk you're gonna have for Alzheimer's disease. And also blood pressure variability. We don't understand, you know, some people have what we call the sort of blood pressure or autonomic insufficiency. Their pressures could go high and low and all over. That also seems to be uh, accumulated uh, with risk. So um, I, 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 again, over 60 years, uh, maybe not as strong, but um, again, you're going to prevent stroke or heart attack. So I think you treat blood pressure no matter what. Now, now what's treating blood pressure? That's a that's a hot one. Uh, most people will say try to get it below 130 uh, or at least down to 130 systolic. And that's what the data would suggest in preventing Alzheimer's. But you and I both know either yourself, you've had, you know, maybe um, siblings, parents, grandparents, they can't get their blood pressure down much below 150 or 140. They get dizzy and lightheaded. So you, you have to treat to the individual and, and do what you can uh, from that standpoint. All right. Oh, here's a hot one. Let's talk about alcohol. I'll get some people fired up. So alcohol is very, con it's not controversial. It's just that the literature on <clears throat> risk is confusing. Part of it is because people use different units. Like in the States, we like to talk about, in fact, I wrote it down here at the bottom. If, if you can read this bottom slide, uh, a one standard drink 
contains roughly 14 gram, 12 to 14 grams of alcohol, which is 12 ounces of regular beer, if that's 4%. Now, you and I both know if you like the Belgian doubles or triples, you're going to have more than, than uh, uh, tw uh, 14 grams of alcohol in that. Um, so uh, five ounces of wine, four or five ounces, uh, maybe 1.5 ounces of spirits, that, that's going to be about 14 grams of alcohol. And so when you start comparing studies, you know, over in the UK and Europe, they, they go by units and, and they talk about eight grams being one unit, which is kind of smaller than what we're used to in the United States. So a lot of the data and the data from the Lancet, of course, is from the UK. So we got to be a little careful saying drinks versus units. You know, until this article came out, I kind of, as I communicated to my patients, both for prevention and treatment, I'd say, well, you know, men can have a couple drinks and, you know, women should maybe go with one. Part of that has to do with association with breast cancer. Um, but three or more, uh, definitely you should try to avoid. And, and you know, that's still a reasonable recommendation. However, the, the more recent meta-analyses suggest that it's probably smaller than that. And, and probably sticking to just one drink a day uh, is, is pretty good. Um, or um, um, as they say in the, the British Medical Journal 2018, they had 10,000 participants. If you didn't drink, you were at risk for Alzheimer's. And if you had 14 units or more per week, um, that was associated with an increased risk. So that that's getting to count out two, two and a half drinks a day. So my point is, and and it is a little controversy about abstinence. So I'm not saying like, if you're not drinking, you should start drinking. You can get your health benefits in other ways. Um, it, it's a little more complicated about, well, 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 drinking somewhere between one to 14 units a week, or say you um, uh, have you know one drink based on the US standard uh, a day, is that protective? And we can't say that. There's data to cross both ways, but it looks like if anything, it's neutral, it's not harmful, but you get up and you know definitely three or more drinks a day and probably two or more may uh, be associated with increased uh, uh, dementia. Now, people ask me, well, well, Dr. Carr, what if I just have my five or six drinks on the weekend and just get it all done? Uh, and <laughs> again, it's per week, but binge drinking, we define as five or more, and that puts you at the risk for a brain ble bleed or a cerebral hemorrhage. So uh, I try to avoid the binge drinking too. Now, how does alcohol affect the brain? Probably a different lot of me mechanisms. There's probably direct toxicity to the brain cells or the neuron. We don't know the people that drink, you know, they may smoke, they may have other uh, comorbidities. Um, people that have alcohol problems tend to have specific genes that may also tie in alcohol. Alcohol may cause chronic inflammation. And so that, that may um, increase um, amyloid. Um, there's your, your brain has ways to get rid of the amyloid and alcohol seems to inhibit some of those enzymes that are kind of trying to help with clearance. And ultimately people who drink really heavy, get malnourished, lose weight, they can get this Korsakoff syndrome or Wernicke's encephalopathy, and that's based on thymine deficiency, but that, that's sort of the minority of the mechanisms that we typically think. So what to do? Well, if you're drinking three or more a drink and you're into health benefits, I'd decrease it preferably to one drink a day based on what we sort of describe as uh, either units or, um, or grams if you're going to use the um, 14 grams or one standard drink. All right, now let's talk about obesity. And in midlife, uh, being overweight um, can put you at risk. Now, it's interesting, there is this obesity paradox where if you're over age 70 and you're overweight then, you seem to have, on average, a reduced risk of mortality and morbidity. But in midlife, not so much. And so um, there, there's probably a lot of different factors. Um, you know, leptin uh, is this hormone that... Um, we think, um, you know, can help you with, you know, satiety and, and not get overweight. And, um, but if, if that ends up, you, you've got some resistance to that, it can really affect the, uh, uh, the pathology and um, from um, accumulating an Alzheimer's disease. And 
Um, generally, in some studies, especially studies of women, if your waist circumference is 34 inches or more, that may put you at increased risk. And, and so weight loss in midlife is a real, um, um, you know, there's so many ways to do it. Not, I'm saying necessarily easy, but a lot of new drugs that um, can be uh, uh, prescribed. Um, so hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, oxidative stress, inflammation, association with cardiovascular disease, diabetes. There's probably a lot of different mechanisms uh, that uh, may cause Alzheimer's disease when we're uh, obese. So something to work on uh, for uh, treatment. So that's sort of the midlife uh, things that are going on. Now let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, late life. And by late life, we're talking over 65 years. Now, when I was giving this talk 30 years ago, and I was, <laughs> there was data to suggest smoking was protective, but that was because people died from their cancer and, and they didn't live long enough to get Alzheimer's disease. And, and we found a lot of studies now that definitely show uh, a tight correlation uh, between smoking uh, and Alzheimer's disease. And uh, interesting study uh, looking at the uh, National Health Service uh, in Korea, where uh, they looked at 46,000 um, uh, older adults and uh, over age 60 plus. Uh, they looked at 27 studies and um, uh, smoking was strongly associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's. Now, interesting, um, whoopsie, let me go back here. Um, never smoking, okay, great, decreased risk, but this was really interesting. If you smoked, but you quit for at least four years, your risk went back down. So that's pretty good news. You know, let's say you're being a smoker, you made to age 65 and you're like, well, what does it matter? Oh, it still matters for lung cancer and for all the cancers associated. But for Alzheimer's disease, the good news is if you stop, you know, four years, your risk is probably going to go down. Now, how does smoking damage the brain? As you might imagine, you get atherosclerosis, so vascular disease, that white matter disease in the brain is an issue. Um, we know that, uh, you know, cigarettes have toxins. Those toxins can get in your system and cause inflammation. Um, I'm not sure the mechanism, but cigarettes especially will cause your homocysteine levels to be elevated, a certain amino acid. And, and as those levels go up, they tend to cause atherosclerosis and vascular disease. Probably because if you smoke, you're probably doing other things like drinking and not taking care of your diet. And so there could be some associated conditions tied in there. There's also a fair amount of hydrocarbons and metal ions, and, and those tend to uh, cause damage and uh, the amyloid protein levels can go up. So, you know somebody who's smoking? See if you can get them to stop. They may prevent uh, some dementia from coming on from that perspective. Pr pretty exciting stuff. All right, now um, let's talk about depression. So uh, people will say, well, Dr. Carr, if I get depressed in my 60s, is that really a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? Maybe I'm depressed because I'm losing my memory or it's slipping, uh, and it's really a sign of Alzheimer's disease. Well, that's true. Some investigators have said that, that if you know, you're depressed in, in, in late life um, and, and you are symptomatic, um, it, it, it could be one and the same. It could be tied up. But I'm talking about people who aren't having really any cognitive problems, but are depressed over age 60, 65. And, in this interesting study, in the Journal of Clinical Medicine in, in just uh, 2021, they combined you know, 28 studies, they did a, a series of meta-analyses, and they definitely showed, and, and again, I'm just showing you one study here on some of these slides. If you go back to that Lancet article, they've got tons of, they probably 15, 20 studies really well done in all these categories. So, but I'm just giving you a little sprinkling, which I thought would, would be helpful. So. Um, so depression definitely associated with Alzheimer's risk. You know, we use scales. There's one called the uh, Physician Health Questionnaire. Um, the, the scales aren't so much a risk than if the diagnosis. So if we diagnose somebody as having, you know, major depression or significant clinical depression, uh, that tends to um, be more correlated with uh, dementia risk. So if 
if depression independently may bring the brain down, how does it do that? Well, some of it is um, HPA access, that's endocrine, that's your uh, you know, pituitary and hippocampus, the areas in the brain that secrete hormones. And so <clears throat> one of those are what we call glutacoric corticoids. You may be familiar with prednisone and steroids. That's what we're kind of talking, the body's internal steroids could go up. Well, you're under stress, so boom, those can go up. Uh, and, and those levels can raise blood sugar levels and cause uh, inflammation, chronic inflammation. Um, uh, and then you get these inflammatory kind of hormones we call cytokines. And, and the memory area, the hippocampus of the brain seems to be very vulnerable to, to this uh, and, and can shrink. Um, and uh, you get the cognitive deficit and Alzheimer's disease. So um, the uh, uh, other mechanisms, you know, some of the drugs and not so much some of the recent ones, but some of the tricyclic antidepressants back in the day, Elevil, and, uh, and I'm not talking about if you're on just a little dose, 10 milligrams or 25 to sleep, and don't stop any of your medicines based on what I'm saying here. Always talk with your doctor. I need to put that little uh, piece in. But some interesting literature that shows that, you know, so, some of those drugs, the older ones, uh, may independently contribute somehow to developing Alzheimer's. We mentioned inflammation, cortisol levels, vascular disease, there may be a disruption of the blood-brain barrier um, and uh, from that standpoint. So, um, and I mentioned the uh, coexistence with uh, uh, dementia. Now, um, the, uh, another interesting part is social isolation. So, you know, there are people who are loners throughout their lifespan. And I'll share with you some pretty robust data on if you're married versus divorced versus you've been single your whole life, <clears throat> what is that? How does that uh, pan out for your risk for Alzheimer's disease? But first of all, no matter how you define social isolation, and uh, a lot of times in the literature, people will, uh, researchers will have patients fill out or participants research questionnaires, you know, how many people do you see in a week or uh, how many close people do you talk to and how often? So they'll quantitate that and come up with a, a definition and you can go back to the paper and see how they define it. But however you define it, it's pretty pretty consistent finding in, in a lot of different countries. And, and incidentally, all this data has to do with developed countries. We don't have a lot of studies for obvious reasons in, in less developed third world countries. Um, but, you know, again, being in the United States, I think it's appropriate to talk about these studies because pretty consistent. So in this study in BMJ uh, Open uh, Journal in 2021, um, they have this biobank cohort study where they've got 155,000 people over age 64 years. And they sent them this questionnaire and then they followed them over time. And sure enough, social isolation was with increased risk. And it didn't matter what genetic risk factors you had. Uh, now, they also had a questionnaire for loneliness, and there were certainly a lot of people who were lonely, but loneliness, how they defined it, did not um, seem to um, uh, impart independent risk for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So if being a loner um, puts you at increased risk, how does this happen? So some of this is, we do know people live on their own, tend to have higher heart disease levels and higher blood pressure. So you know, maybe not having a companion puts you at risk for that. And, you know, you think about it, you may have some behaviors. I'm not talking about you. Let me talk about me. That may not be so healthy, but, you know, say you have a partner, they're going to weigh in and say, you know, you haven't been to the doctor for a while, or you're smoking too much, or you're drinking too much. Uh, you know, that feedback can be helpful. Well, you don't have that if, if you're socially isolated. So those behaviors can come up. We know there's more depression, a less cognitive engagement, uh, and probably less cognitive reserve that you're building up. So all these are potential mechanisms on how social isolation may impart risk for future Alzheimer's disease. Now, studies have shown in multiple countries that if you're single and you're never married, you're at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now, don't get me wrong. These are very small risks. If you're single and you're happy, <laughs> you're probably going to be better off than if you're married and sad. Um, and uh, uh, But you, you know where I'm going at with this. Now, now widows are um, in between uh, and divorce is kind of in between. And then if you've been married, 
uh, and, and consistently or, or currently married in later life, uh, that uh, bodes well for a decreased uh, risk. So exercise, it's really uh, interesting. Uh, now we say in late life, if you're inactive, it's a risk factor, but <clears throat> if you're inactive in late life, you're probably inactive in midlife. So, you know, um, if your physical activity in midlife, which we know is great for the heart and uh, for preventing stroke, I, I think is a, a benefit. Um, but we do know that if you're not working out over age 65, that puts you at risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now, how does it do this? Well, <clears throat> you may be helping your connections in your brain. You may be making new neurons and sprouting some blood vessels. You may be cutting down on obesity and with that decreased inflammation. Um, your power pack units of the cell may be a better quality. You're taking that glucose, you're putting it into the cell. So, so it just can benefit a lot of different areas which kind of feed back to the brain. How intense does the exercise need to be? Well, first let's talk about how much time. What's your entry level? How much exercise do you need to do in order to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease? There, there's not a, you know, a, a perfect answer to that, but growing literature suggests 150 minutes or more a week. Now, when you first hear 150 minutes, it seems like a lot, but when I talk with my patients who are active, hey, they're doing a, you know, a brisk walk here, a yoga there, Pilates there, uh, it, you know, maybe you're in resistance training in a gym, you can get that done. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of, if it's moderate or vigorous, you're usually having a little bit of a sweat. Now that's not to say if you can't get to that point, it's not a benefit, but a moderate to vigorous activity and 150 minutes or more a week. And uh, a great, great way, of course, help with depression and mood. And there, there could be a lot of different factors that could be going on there. So uh, pollution. So this is interesting. I remember one of the first Alzheimer's conferences I went to in the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in St. Louis, um, there was an investigator there that was looking at death rates in many countries. And at the time, Alzheimer's disease was kind of fifth or sixth causes of death in, in, in the world, of course, we weren't diagnosing it very well 30 years ago, and it was probably a higher prevalence. We weren't just calling it. But I remember him presenting some data in Shanghai, China. And the two most common causes of death in people over age 70 were COPD or lung disease and Alzheimer's disease. And he found this to be very fascinating. So the question came up, why are the people in Shanghai, how, how is Alzheimer's disease in the top two causes of death? Well, a lot of people smoke and they have a lot of problems with pollution. And, you know, there's been a lot of studies. This is a journal of the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, a couple of years ago, they did a big combination, nine studies, over 150,000, 55,000 people over age 64. And, and the bottom line, if, if you measured um, you know, sulfides and carbon monoxide in the air. Other studies have shown uh, uh, nitric oxide, nitrites, that sort of thing, and, and particulate matter. You're definitely at an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And so we're not quite sure is that's increasing the amount of amyloid. There is this compound uh, that's called magnetite that is particulate matter from uh, uh, that seems to also be found in the amyloid plaques. Is that playing a role? But we as a society need to make sure we have good air, clean air to breathe in. And uh, it's something to uh, obviously consider uh, where you live, how you live. I mean, there's been studies that show if you live right on a busy street, you may be at more risk for Alzheimer's disease than you are if you live farther back in the neighborhood. So, you know, some of these things, I think there's more stuff like that, that we're going to find out about. It's like looking for a needle in the haystack. But, um, you know, people like to study more obvious things that you can look at. These environmental studies are challenging. Uh, but again, people are doing it. They're finding out. They're tracking people over time. And these studies take a while. 
you know, 10, 15, 20 years, you're following people to see if they have diseases. So they're not easy to do. Uh, but again, pollution, not a good thing. So the other thing that um, is a risk factor in late life is diabetes. And <clears throat> whether it's an increased risk for coronary artery disease, stroke, causing inflammation, um, uh, it's hard to say. We, we know that with, with diabetes, as your blood sugar goes up, you get a, um, your, your energy mitochondria area of the cell will have some dysfunction from sugars levels being high, you get more oxidative stress and inflammation. And this all causes a lot of this protein plaque to accumulate, which can go on and, and, and cause uh, problems from that standpoint. In fact, there are some people have referred to Alzheimer's disease as type three diabetes. There seems to be fewer insulin receptors on the brain cell. Um, uh, glucose levels can get high and, and, you know, the, um, uh, brain cells relatively starved. That's why some people have looked at um, uh, using uh, um, different types of medium chain triglycerides. Uh, there's a compound called uh, Exona that was popular for a little while that was being used to treat Alzheimer's disease. Some people have looked at coconut oil and, and, and that sort of thing. But um, it is an interesting uh, area of diabetes and insulin and, and risk. So Th those are the things that I think we can say with pretty good confidence um, that have been well studied. I was very disappointed that the Lancet didn't include sleep because in my 30 years of practice, I don't care if you have a circadian rhythm disorder, obstructive sleep apnea, REM behavior, periodic leg movements. If your sleep is being disrupted, you're in trouble because that heavy, deep sleep is where you get rid of your amyloid plaques and you restore yourself. But you know, and not all sleep disorders necessarily drop your oxygen level. I think you could probably appreciate if uh, um, uh, you've got obstructive sleep apnea and you're not being treated, your oxygen level can go down, uh, you can get an inflammation, cardiovascular disease, all of this may tie in. So, and, and the risk is especially high if you're getting less than six hours or five, and, and conversely, it's the same way. If you're sleeping too much, it means you're not getting the deep restful sleep. So those that are at risk for Alzheimer's disease, uh, if you're sleeping 10 or more hours, don't feel so good about yourself. That's not normal. So, um, you know, you probably need a sleep study or to be referred. So I think we're going to find that sleep is going to jettison up there and be one of the top risk factors. And remember, it's not the quantity of the time that you spend in bed. It's the quality. And if you're napping off during the day and you're taking, you know, dozing off, I know, you know, what I hear all the time, well, they're 80 or 90 years old. What do you expect? No, I don't expect you to sleep during the day if you're getting good night's sleep. And so I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, I do think sleep is tied in with brain health. People do better. Um, and certainly not as crabby, and I can speak to that. All right, atrial fibrillation. You know, it didn't come out in the Lancet, but I think in the next five or 10 years, growing evidence that this, this irregular heartbeat puts you at risk for Alzheimer's. Now, how? Well, we don't know. We know that sometimes you can have teeny tiny small strokes for emboli that can go up to the brain. We, we also know that, um, you know, you may your heart pump, when you're in atrial fibrillation, you got four chambers of your heart. Well, two of the chambers, you know, are going to be fibrillating. And so the amount of blood that's being ejected from the heart isn't as much, right? So your ejection fraction is going to be uh, less. And maybe it's that hypoperfusion to the brain that puts you on the road for Alzheimer's. The good news is for those of you that have atrial fibrillation say, oh no, I got atrial fibrillation. Well, if you're on warfarin or coumadin, or you're on one of the new uh, DOAC drugs that uh, uh, that can help, um, you know, reduce Xeralto or um, uh, um, some of the um, uh, other ones, that that seems to reduce the risk of dementia, which is good. Now they didn't they talk about diet in the review, but they didn't put it down as a strong one, and that's because the data is emerging. A lot of it's on the Mediterranean diet. And, and truth be told, most of the people in the strong, really good studies that have benefited 
started out in midlife with cardiovascular risk factors, high blood pressure, um, uh, diabetes, et cetera. Having said that, we think it, it's, it's a winner. You know, lots of veggies, nuts, cereals, olive oil, uh, low saturated fat diets, you know, lean meats, uh, good. Medications, anticholinergic agents, some of the antihistamines, some of the uh, anticholinergic bladder agents, et cetera. There seems to be an association with Alzheimer's disease. Now, is it just people are testing or we're bringing out their symptoms more? Are the drugs actually causing some injury to the brain? We don't know. Again, don't stop your medicine on my account, um, but it is an interesting thing. And, you know, we're putting people on so many drugs these days and we don't know what they're all doing. And, you know, you take a pill and, okay, I guess I'll be on it for another 20, 30 years. So I think what's going to happen 10, 20, 30 years from now, people are going to look back and say, well, this combination of drugs or this drug, and the evidence is pretty strong. It may not be a good thing. So there's not a lot we could do about this, but just be prepared. We may find that there are some, some drugs that aren't too brain friendly as we study them. Infections are another interesting area. People have had some of the herpes viruses, um, uh, bacterial pneumonia, uh, dental issues, uh, seem to be at increased risk. Now, how and why, we don't know. Um, there, there are some still people holding on to sort of an infectious hypothesis to Alzheimer's disease and, and looking at those things. So I think more to come on that. Um, so those are some risk factors, and you may have some more that you've read about. What are some additional interventions? So this concept of complex mental activity, you know, where you're doing data management or uh, you, you are a leader or management in your work or, or you're an educator teacher, um, those things seem to be protective. Again, not as well studied as some of the other stuff I presented. Uh, growing literature on dancing, gardening, um, and, and retirement. Early retirees tend not to do as well over age 65 as late retirees. Um, now that could work the other way too. If your job's wearing you down and wearing you out and it's more stress, that's not gonna help your, your glucocorticoid levels. Uh, but the point is staying active, I think is good. People will always ask me about supplements and I just, I'm my, you know, just being my honest self, authentic self here is I'm not a big supplement fan. I think it's a big leap of faith to think you can take one little, you know, you know, vitamin E or B6 or all these vitamins and they're going to they're going to do a trick. The, the reality is our brains are under attack from a lot of different mechanisms and, and I think taking a specific supplement uh is just not going to cut it and a lot of these are expensive. You don't know what they're made out of, you know, they're not regulated by the FDA. They could have drug prescription uh interactions. Having said that, if you're taking something and you think it works for you, great. Just make sure if you're on other prescription medicines, you talk with your doctor or your pharmacist to see if there's any problems. People love computer training, or some do. They like to get on and uh, Luminosity and Nintendo Brain Game. God, I did a Nintendo Brain Game 10 years ago, and it said I had the brain of an 80-year-old, but I, I was hoping that would be a very sharp 80-year-old, and nothing uh, against uh, that. But um, I, I'm not too convinced that the literature on computer training is that helpful. I think it could be fun. You'll get better at that task, but as far as there being any um, bleed over, I uh, our uh, you know effect where it's going to help uh, your brain, we we don't really see that. Now I do think the social things where you know whether it's a, a games cards where you're in a group and you're making decisions it hasn't been well studied, but um, you know some literature on that and travel, playing music, art. Um, you know, learning a second language, those are all things you might want to consider because uh, there is some literature that suggests things are going good. As far as interventions go, um, there's not a whole lot out there, large trials that have shown efficacy. You know, the, the big buzzword these days are multi-domain interventions and the, the finger, a Finnish study was a randomized controlled trial that, um, you know, looked at 1200 people in uh, Finland, and you either got usual care, which means, you know, a little health advice every couple months, or you got uh, put on an exercise regimen, cognitive training, social activity, um, uh, additional education on your health behaviors. 
And uh, it did show a 25% reduction in cognitive decline by psychometric testing. So that's very interesting. That was a more recent one. That was in the Lancet. And then there's this healthy aging through internet counseling. So, you know, do we really have to come in? Can we do this online? And this was a study of 2,700. And, and it did show improvement in cardiovascular risk scores and a dementia risk score, not to dementia per se, but I think there's more to be done and be said along those lines. So if, um, if you're dozing off during the day, I would get online, search this. The Epworth sleepiness scale is something that uh, I think would be uh, really worth taking. You get a score greater than 10, uh, I would go to a sleep clinic. So um, now again, if you're on opioids or Alprazolam, Xanax, there's probably reasons why you're dozing. But um, all things being equal, like I said, low threshold to get in and uh, look things up uh, or get your sleep evaluated. This is from the Alzheimer's Association website. Uh, basically, 10 things you can do. I summarize them here on the next slide. Uh, but if you get on the Alzheimer's Association, uh, 10 ways to love your brain, uh, basically is, is what we're going to say here. I'm going to put this last one up and, <clears throat> and conclude. I know I kind of chewed up the time, but I'm still doing pretty good on time for those that can hang. I can um, grab five or 10 minutes of questions. And I know there's some chat things coming in. So in summary, community engagement, keep learning, good nutrition, exercise, make sure you're into your primary care doc, getting hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, cholesterol being managed, reduce obesity. For God's sake, if you've got a hearing impairment and, and the recommendation has been for hearing aids, wear them. You may be saving some brain cells. Limit your alcohol, prevent the head trauma, wear your helmet, stop smoking, and get a good night's sleep. And remember, it's never too early or never too late to save a brain cell. And on that note, it's a wrap. That's all I got. Very good. Well, fantastic, Dr. Carr. Um, as you said, um, if you want to uh, stop your um, screen share, we can um, talk about some of the, the questions that were in the chat. So um, at, Alex had the question, what if you were completely deaf to begin with? That, that's an interesting um, idea. If, if hearing loss increases um, your chance for Alzheimer's, what about people who were deaf from birth? Yeah, so uh, I don't know. I would think there would be uh, a potential. Um, and I'm on the Alzheimer's Society, not the Alzheimer's Association, but Alzheimer's Society website. And uh, it might be worth uh, taking a look and seeing what they have to say. I don't know the answer to that question. I'd have to research it and, and look it up. There's certainly, a, I guess, some potential there. Uh, but I think it would be very hard um, to have enough of those individuals and follow over time and then you know correct for some of the confounding things that could go along. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. I just, I don't know. Well, I'll have to have to do a little research on that. Um, so um, Sally asked, if you are having trouble sleeping, is it better to take sleeping aids rather than not sleep or is, or or is that harmful? Yeah. So I, I don't think necessarily um, hearing aids or <laughs> sleeping aids, <laughs> I'm stuck on hearing, uh, are that harmful? Um, now, as you get older and maybe your gait's not as stable, there is a risk for falls and fractures with some of the sleeping pills like Ambien and um, you know, maybe trazodone a little bit. We prescribe a lot of these medicines to help people sleep. I don't think they're necessarily going to be that harmful, but I don't think they're going to be that helpful when it comes to restoring the sleep cycle. So, you know, if you have trouble with sleep onset and, and you're taking melatonin over the counter, whatever dose works for you, I think that's fine. And then if you're getting your seven or eight hours of sleep, and you're awake and alert during the day, I think that's fine. But but if you're taking a sleeping pill and you're still pretty wiped out the next day, you know, you may be getting through the night, but I would argue your quality still may not be well. 
if you're taking your sleeping pill and then the next day you're refreshed and you know you're you're not nodding off during activities and uh, you can do the upward scale see if you're less than ten points, then then the pill's probably working for you. To piggyback on what Sally asked, so is there a I know correlation does not equal causation, but um, with Xanax and Alprazolam and longer term use of that of those types of medications and Alzheimer's. So there is some uh, literature. I didn't mention the benzos, but those are the class of drug we call benzodiazepines. And, and there is some literature similar to some of the anticholinergic drugs like the tricyclics and the antihistamines that suggest it may be putting people at risk. That data is still pretty weak, still emerging. Um, I think, you know, people that have uh, anxiety and need those medicines, <clears throat> they have a lot of stress. So it may be their cortisol levels are up or, or maybe that stress manifests in other ways with heart disease and, and then that affects the brain. So um, I think like anything else, those drugs do put you at risk for falls in a motor vehicle crash. So even if we find out someday you know, they're really not a major factor to develop Alzheimer's. I think limiting them and trying to treat anxiety with other uh, medicines like the uh, SSRI class of drugs, escitalopram or Lexapro or sertraline or Zoloft is the way to go. Okay, I'm aware of the time, but we do have um, another question. Um, someone asked, someone said, I run a body temperature in the low 97s. Do I have less inflammation than people who have? higher body temperatures? You know, I don't know the exact answer to that, but I think it makes sense because I think the uh, uh, higher you go, the more uh, metabolism you're, you're going to have. Um, and I think you're going to feed the fuel for inflammation. Um, so I would think the lower body temperature you have, you're kind of chilling out and, and that could very well be the case. Uh, that'd be another very, you guys are asking some great questions. I need to do a little more research on that. So I'm not quite sure what Les is asking here, but he says, what if you are a caregiver? Are you, Les, are you saying, are you asking if that increases your risk? You, okay, he's shaking his head, yes. So yeah, yes, yes. There, there is, yes. There, there is some data that suggests you are at increased risk for um, uh, health issues, for, you know, um, uh, morbidities, uh, those sorts of things, and, and a little bit. Uh, that you may be at risk. Now, is it the caregiver stress or the fact that you, you know, both both uh, the spouse um, and the partner, you know, share some uh, behaviors that, um, you know, might not have been too healthy and that sort of thing. So um, that's not a very strong one and, and more data is needed, but, you know, there is some preliminary that suggests that, that it, it could be a factor. Uh, association, not necessarily causation. We also, let's also ask about MJ gummies. I'm not sure. I think that's marijuana. Okay. And um, yeah, so that, that's interesting. Um, we know that the uh, acute effects of um, uh, cannabis or uh, related compounds, um, you know, can affect uh, concentration and, and, and mental abilities. And mostly the amounts that people take are pretty, pretty low dose and, and not a big factor. Uh, I haven't seen enough consumption uh, in studies longitudinally uh, to know um, whether that's a factor or not. Uh, just based on, um, you know, the, I think it'd be a very hard study to do just because there's so many different types of compounds and the way people consume them. But I think that's a great research question and one that uh, uh, remains to be elucidated uh, over time. So the last question, um, Deborah wants to know if she's taking antihistamines daily in the spring through the fall um, for allergies, is she at an increased risk? So I would say I, I don't think so because uh, the studies that show for you know anticholinergic agents or people have been on them year in, year out, 365 days a year and, and for you know five, 10 years or even longer. Um, Plus, we know that not all antihistamines are similar. So a lot of that data had to do with the older antihistamines like diphenhydramine and um, you know, Benadryl, Atarax, that sort of thing. The, the newer ones, the uh, second generation antihistamines, uh, uh, Claritins and the Allegras, 
I think uh, certainly don't appear to be as powerful and sedating. Uh, so my recommendation would be, even if you're only taking them periodically, if if they're effective, would be to go with one of the newer ones. And they've been out for a while. I can't even say they're that new anymore. Okay, this will be the last question, that, and it's a good one. If both parents had Alzheimer's, is there a test I can have to see if my brain is at beginning stages, perhaps before symptoms occur? So uh, that answer is yes, uh, there are tests. Um, there's three types of tests. One is a PET scan, uh, one is a blood test, and uh, one is a spinal tap test where you measure the fluid. And you know, if you don't have symptoms and you're normal and your tests are normal, uh, you can get one of these tests and uh, we can see if you have significant amounts of amyloid and now even tau with the uh, uh, spinal tap tests and there's now tau PET scans that, you know, would could diagnose you with what we call preclinical or pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. But there, um, right now, all research, you'd have to pay out of pocket. And the bigger question is, is what really change your risk. If both parents had Alzheimer's, you know, you're probably at a three or four fold increased risk, not absolute odds are you still, uh, something else is going to come along and it won't be Alzheimer's, but I don't think you'd, uh, uh, change. I guess what I'm saying is when it comes to prevention, even if you just had one family member, um, with the disease, I think I do all the prevention you can. And I don't think, um, getting one of those tests, uh, would change it in my mind. Now, there's a big study, uh, it's called the um, anti-amyloid and asymptomatic, like the AAA study. So, so one of the questions that we have with these new monoclonal antibody drugs is, you know, right now the FDA just approved one for symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. Um, can we give those drugs in people who are preclinical? And that study is probably going to come out later this year. And that's going to be very interesting. So, so we may evolve to a point where we may recommend clinically to get these tests to see if you're accumulating and then give some um, medications for uh, prevention. But I think like anything else, these antibodies and, you know, that's how big pharma makes their money with uh, $25,000 a year drugs. And um, when, when, um, a Mediterranean diet and wearing some hearing aids and exercising and limiting your alcohol. It may not be as sexy, but boy, it's uh, uh, some of that's going to be a little more fun and uh, uh, a lot less expensive to society and, and to Medicare. Anyway, uh, all good. Thank you so much for being in here and listening. I had a lot of fun and would love to come back again sometime. Well, Dr. Carp, thank you so very much. You're an excellent speaker. I love how you made things. You explained things simply so we could understand, and you gave us ways to build up our cognitive reserve. And so I'm going to start applying all those techniques that, that you talked about today. Thank you so much. You're, You're very best. welcome. Everybody have a good rest of your week. Okay. Take care, everyone. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.